From Microbe TV, this is Tweevo, This Week in Evolution, episode number 69, recorded on June 30th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast about what? What is it again? The podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Joining me today from Salt Lake City, Nell Zeldi. Hey, Vincent. Great to be back. And yeah, you do a lot of podcasts and it's, uh, <laughs> a lot of topics to cover for sure. And by the way, hey, thank you for your patience um, with me. We are going to do this. And thanks to our listeners, actually. Thanks for your patience. We we're going to do this last week, our monthly episode. And then uh, my daughter, now one year old, decided to do her own personal virology experiment. She was running a fever 103, <laughs> some sort of virus in there. She's recovered beautifully, a little, still a little snotty, but uh, doing fine back in daycare. And we're back on Tuivo. It's good to be here today. Yeah, no problem. We, you know, we have great understanding for viral illnesses or any illness <laughs> or any excuse. Very good. And I'm glad to report this also was not uh, COVID. So we did the test with her and she, that came back negative, which actually allows us to uh, get her back to daycare a lot quicker. We don't have to do the longer quarantine period. And so just a standard run of the mill virus if you're a little one. Yeah, very good. Yeah. So with Nails, we have a bit of a full plate today, right? Yeah, we do. So we're going to do kind of a sampler platter, I would say, of some more SARS-2 evolution, of course. Um, I think this is an important moment, actually, as we see the science kind of swirling with the news headlines, maybe swirling with some of the politics mm -hmm. to try to cover a few of these topics and maybe put it into a little bit of perspective, our own, some of our own ideas about how to think about some of this stuff. So we'll be swimming in SARS sequences, um, so to speak, or I guess literally. So three papers today, two published and one preprint. And uh, yeah, I propose, why don't we just dive right in? Sure. Let's do it. Okay, so the first paper is um, recently published in the journal Cell. The title of the work is Identification of Novel Bat Coronaviruses Sheds Light on the Evolutionary Origins of SARS-2 and Related Viruses. This is a, um author list. Oh, thanks for putting this up, Vincent. Yes, yeah, so this is an author list um, from a number of scientists working out of southern China in the Yunnan province, and then um, sort of a familiar name as well to Tuivo, an evolutionary virologist, Eddie Holmes, one of the corresponding authors, along with Alice Hughes and Wei Feng Shi, who is um, the lead contact on the study. And so, you know, we've been, we've been talking a lot about SARS-2 itself, and we'll actually talk about some of that diversity, some of those sequences, um, as the question of the origins of SARS-2 in the last month, I think, has really bubbled to the surface again. Um, but I think, you know, this paper caught my eye. I think, actually, you guys covered this on TWIV, if I'm remembering correctly. Is that true, Vincent? Yeah, we did cover it a couple of weeks ago. Um, but I always, I, you know, when you mentioned it, I said, yeah, we have to get Nels's perspective, because you come from a different angle. Um, you know, we have... We come from a vir pure virology angle. You have an evolutionary uh, bent, and I wanted to hear your your thoughts on it as well. Yeah, yeah. I so think we'll it's talk an important about it. paper. I, I think I it's agree. really important, and uh, it's kind of being ignored. So I, uh, let's go over it. Yeah. Yeah. No. Good idea. And I would put. So I haven't had a chance to catch up with that Twiv yet. Again, the um, you know the podcasts coming out multiple times a week. It's a spectacular um, resource. Uh, as this is all unfolding to, to catch up on the virology in particular. And so I'll imagine by this weekend, I'll catch up on it. But please, obviously, fill in the details that, that I miss. But so I agree. I, I thought it was a really important one to cover. And, and partially because it's, you know, what we look at and what we talk about sort of is what, what, is, what are we paying attention to or, or what's driving the conversation. And I think right now, we've been spending a lot of time considering SARS-2 sequences of the diversity of variants or the diversity that might have been uh, or what do the viruses look like back in late 2019? But what this paper does, I think, really nicely is says, well, hold on, what's going on just sort of beneath our noses or kind of invisible to us, the natural coronaviruses, other viruses that are circulating, for example, in bats. And so this group um, set out from a time interval, a, a pretty relevant time interval here from May 2019 before SARS-2 emerged. 
um, through November 2020. So even, you know, I guess halfway through the pandemic so far and did some sampling of bats. Um, so these are horseshoe bats and some related species um, that are known to have a lot of coronaviruses. In fact, you know, um, SARS-2 has been there's uh, hypothesized to emerge from some of these um, horseshoe bat species in one form or another. And so they went to a botanical garden, uh, captured some bats, uh, took fecal, oral, and urine samples, released the bats um, back, and then um, used that material to do some genomic sequencing. And they were able from just, you know, um, uh, this sort of time interval of work to actually put together or find lots of coronavirus sequences and even enough that they were able to do the de novo assembly of 25 new genomes of coronaviruses. So this is adding to sort of the natural history or the natural sampling of these viruses that are circulating in bats, in this case in southern China, um, and, and in some cases in Southeast Asia, given the ecology here. And, and if I may add now, part of the problem is we have SARS-CoV-2, and yeah. then we have, you know, a handful of close viruses, but as you have said, not enough to really make a nice tree. And so we need to fill in the gaps. So the closest one up to this study is uh, RATG13 from 2013. So <laughs> too much of a gap. And as you guys say, we don't even know where to root this tree because there's so few specimens, right? That's right. And then because you kind of, for some of the analysis you want to do as an evolutionary virologist, you do need roots. And, and the data you have in hand is going to dictate that to some degree. And so you're always looking for more sequences, more closely related sequences in this case, yeah. to try to get a little bit of that perspective because you couldn't, you know, your, your sampling is going to dictate to some degree some of the inferences that you make, and they might not be as robust. They might not sort of recapitulate the true relationships, the true history um, that for many reasons is actually is quite important, whether it's SARS-2 or other viruses uh, in, you know, any tree, any phylogenetics that you're doing, if it's mammals, for example, some of the same issues are, are certainly at play. I read a paper yesterday, Nels, where they tried six different methods for rooting the, the SARS-CoV tree, and they said yeah. none They're of them are different. really great. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And so absolutely, you know, some real interest here in, in doing better. So, you know, maybe I'll cut to the punchline a little bit in the end. So I think this is a really important sampling of in illustrating some of the natural diversity. I don't know that the, um, you know, they kind of came a little short of finding a lot of really closely related sequences, yeah. although there is one that for most of the genome is a closer relative to SARS-2. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but for an important reason is not um, over, and as you sort of do the entire genome comparison is not more closely related. So rat, um, rat G13 or um, RATG13 um, is still sort of holds the title for overall across the entire genome being the closest relative to SARS-2. So, and that still, I think, illustrates mm -hmm. how we're pretty under, you know, you could use the phrase undersampled or our sampling is too modest to really have some of that rooting power that you would like with a more closely related sequence. Um, and so one of the issues here actually relates to how these coronaviruses are changing all the time through recombination. And so actually, I don't know if we can pull up figure two. Sure. Um, this, I think, really nicely illustrates. There's a great image here. Um, it starts with kind of a, in panel A, it starts with sort of a heat map. Yeah, thanks. This is perfect. So, and we'll kind of, and, and that, you know, as the colors are warmer, the sequence identity is higher. That's each box is sort of um, cutting the, the genome into pieces uh, sort of by the genes themselves. But I think we'll focus our view here on panel B. And so the query sequence is SARS-CoV-2. And then what we're looking at is for maybe, what is this, eight or so, I think eight of the viruses that were pulled out or are other ones that have, uh, you know, some of the brand names here. Um, the alphabet soup, how closely related are these to SARS-2 as we go from left to right across the genome? So the x-axis is the position in the genome. Remember these viruses, mm -hmm. these are RNA viruses with massive genomes, so from zero to 30,000 RNA bases, super tankers for RNA viruses. And then the y-axis here going from bottom to top is the similarity. So for a window of 100 base <laughs> pairs, if you just compare that to SARS-2, what percent of the RNA letters are identical? And so, you, can, you know, as we start at the left side of the genome, you can see some, this is the really closely related viruses. 
up in the, you know, 95% or even 98, 99% identical. So close relatives, although not like super close relatives, remember viruses mutate quickly. But then as we get kind of three quarters of the way down to the S region, the mm. spike gene, <laughs> Yeah, there we see some action, that. right? Yeah. And so what we were looking at there are signals of recombination. So basically the mm -hmm. virus, which was as you're marching 100 base pair by 100 base pair, that was 95 percent identical. All of a sudden it drops to 20 percent identity at one point for one of these viruses. And that's diagnostic of a recombination event. So it's not that you, you know, for 100 base pairs to go down from 95 percent to 20 percent identity, you would need. Um, what, like 80 mutations to happen all in a short order relative to the rest of the genome. It's a lot easier in one mutational step to just swap in a template switch as the virus is replicating, probably in a co-infection scenario, to swap in another sequence. And that's what you're seeing there. It falls off. And then as you, you'll notice, it goes back up at the end. And so mm -hmm. it's just this small portion yeah. that's recombined in. And so this new virus, and I, I think it's called... RPYN06, right. which for stretches, there it is, yep, it, which for a lot of stretches is Absolutely. actually the most closely related Yeah. Um, as we yeah. go through the 1AB region of the genome, sort of a lot of the conserved coronavirus genes, it actually drops off the table when you get to the spike gene. And so it's had a recombination event. It's probably, um, you know, and this, so these... Re these coronaviruses do this for a living. They recombine. And remember, they're most most of the replication time here is happening in bats, um, maybe in some other wildlife. And so I think what we're seeing here is the potential for natural selection to be acting in these natural reservoirs. That recombination event happens. It's selected on because perhaps that virus replicates a little better in one of these close relatives of the horseshoe bats. And that's really different than, you know, and this is actually one of the um, early points, I think some confusion about SARS-2 was that people saw graphs like this and assumed that uh, SARS-CoV-2 underwent a recombination event, where instead, as we've done some sampling, it looks like it's a lot of the other viruses that underwent recombination that are the relatives. SARS-CoV-2, that um, RATG13, those ones, um, and you can actually see if you look at the S, the sort of red color squiggles there where it doesn't fall down, that's indicative of some variation, but not a recombination event swapping that out. So it's, we don't think it's the case that SARS, the SARS-2 genome underwent recombination, that that somehow was an adaptation that then led to the spillover to humans. In fact, it was, you know, there's uh, either some other explanation um, for ad uh, an adaptive change or a set of adaptive changes that led to the spillover or it was sort of poised and there's more epidemiologic or ecological factors collisions between bats and people or an intermediate host that led to the spillover to humans and then the the pandemic as we know it today i just want to point out here so here on this table here's um ratg 13 right which overall is still the closest right um but if you look at that orf uh, 1AB, which is this big protein here, which contains the RNA polymerase gene. Yeah. And you see this guy, RPYN06, has is, is got more similar percent identity here uh, in that particular region. And then if you go to the end, ORF10, look at this, it's 100% identical. Yet, yeah. you know, the spike drops off quite a bit. This RPYN06 is blue, you know, and that's yep. dropping off. And RATG13, the spike is pretty good. Uh, homology in there so yeah recombination for sure and uh, the thing is Nels that yeah um, these viruses are all over the place you know they're Thailand and China Japan and we're just wherever you look you find them but we never had found any of them before December of last year it's amazing right <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> I agree. Hiding in plain sight. And this gets anger yeah. hitting on a really important, bigger point here that I think is kind of lost in the conversation because that's not so obvious. Um, and, you know, even this sort of high profile paper that's published recently in Cell, there's so much noise about origins of SARS, et cetera, that we still don't this, you know, this one kind of hides in the background almost. But yeah. This is the, you know, these natural reservoirs, the number of coronaviruses, the number of bats they captured here is not that many to find 25 entirely new coronaviruses oh. new to science. And so I think we're really underestimating and it's totally natural because we don't, 
see these things. Viruses are invisible. They're moving invisible. You yeah. know, the bats don't seem sick. We don't pay. We don't have a lot of bat MDs. We're not paying. Very few people pay attention to the health of bats and sort of outside of white nose syndrome, the fungal disease that's causing the extinction of many bats. We don't think about the viruses of what they're doing sort of medically to bats or to those populations. And so we're a little bit, I think our, you know, just sort of how we've framed the science here is a little out of balance. And this paper, I think, speaks to that because even with just going to one botanical garden out in somewhere in Yunnan, all of a sudden you have 25 new viruses, new to science. Mm -hmm. And then <laughs> as you look at the recombination, right, for uh, um, six out of eight of those viruses, looks like they had different recombination events. So those yeah, those right. kind of differences in similarity, they're pretty distinct steps in the relatedness to the other, to the spike gene sequence that you find in rat and RATG13 that you find in mm -hmm. SARS-CoV-2. And so what that tells you, right, is that there's all of this um, genetic exchange hap happening in many cases with uh, other genomes that we haven't looked at at all. And so for me, as an evolutionary virologist, I think, my goodness, this seems like why are we should be paying some attention to this. There's this sure. massive sure. natural reservoir. And, you know, if we kind of spend all of our time and energy thinking about where did SARS-2 come from, we might be a little bit hoodwinked when SARS-3, SARS-4, SARS-5 emerges from some of this genetic exchange that we're just sort of glimpsing at, almost just the tip of the iceberg here Absolutely. Um, from, from Absolutely. this sampling. Yeah. Yep. I want to remind people that for SARS-1, after many years of wildlife sampling, they found a single cave in not too far from the origin where they didn't find the ancestor, but they found pieces, all the pieces that you could recombine together to make SARS-CoV-1 you know, with 99% identity. So this is, you may not find the actual virus, but you'll find all the pieces. And that's what we need to do for SARS-CoV-2, right? We haven't yet done, but you can see from this analysis that we're getting there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And so why does this matter, right? Why more than, you know, sort of curiosity, you're having a sense of the diversity out there. Why does this matter? And so I think the authors mm -hmm. actually go on nicely. It's not like a breakthrough experiment, but they do, what they do is they measure based on some of the mutations that they see in the receptor binding domain. So they actually um, do some binding assays. So do these spike sequences, the, you know, the gene encoding, the protein, does that protein recognize human ACE2 receptor? And these aren't sort of sophisticated experiments. They're just sort of the first experiment you would do um, to ask whether there is recognition through binding as judged by some binding. And in some cases they see weak binding to human ACE2. And so this is important, right? Because I think we really want to know, we, again, just scratching the surface, we'd really want to know, mm -hmm. given the amount of diversity out there, all of these circu circulating spike sequences, in some cases, the only hint that we have of the whole virus that have, has been exchanging it is that little remnant that came through to this other virus. How well, if at all, or how many um, bind the human ACE receptor? And that's, it's not everything, but it's certainly one factor in sort of pandemic potential. Uh, if you can recognize one of the host receptors, there's other host receptors though. And so you, again, you, there's just all this complexity hiding in plain sight, but this does give you a sense um, of, you know, uh, how many of these things could be involved in spillover events um, to other species. And of course, yeah. you know, uh, to humans as well. And so, um, and in that sense, you know, again, not a breakthrough here, but certainly some evidence that there are differences in the ability of these sequences to um, bind human ACE2. And by the way, we shouldn't like sound the panic alarm here. A lot of the evolution that's happening among these viruses is as they're moving between different bats, bats, closely related bat species. And of course, that's where the massive collisions are happening. They point out in the paper, some of the um, ecological modeling they do, where are these bats, the species located, what's the overlap? And that certainly I think is most of the evolutionary story here is how are these things moving almost invisibly between bat species? But then there are these sort of side effects where, or there, well, and there's more collisions with humans, honestly, as we, uh, our own species expands into more um, historically wilderness areas where the viruses might pick up and then in these rare events spill over. But we really, again, are basically, you know, in the dark about how much of that diversity is out there and what does it mean for that um, spillover potential. And so I think really important and underrated um, information here that's being published. I think also it's it's important to point out that 
So in this in the receptor binding domain of the spike, there are six key amino acids for high affinity binding, right? And so yeah. these new viruses that they pull out have changes that reduce the affinity. However, it's interesting that the pangolin isolates have identical six amino acids to SARS-CoV-2. Yet, you know, that has that has arisen arisen independently. So somewhere out there, it's either random, you know, it's parallel evolution, right? To be able That's to right. bind human. There's you know, they're not encountering human <laughs> ACE twos, but there's some random happening so that at some point out of six, you know, the chance that you're going to get the right six to, to hit human can happen randomly, right? <laughs> yeah, agreed. That's a really good point. So this brings up, you know, sort of the independent evolution um, that can happen mm -hmm. that's been observed in many cases here. And again, it's not sort of like definitive, this is the way forward, but we're it's starting to put together kind of um, a set of clues about what are some of the patterns here. Um, and this is really important back, you know, uh, sort of, uh, evidence to build on, to look for more of these patterns, to learn. And just like you're saying, you know, our, our pangolins have, as have been proposed an in inter intermediate host here, the fact that they're pulling out, even in the small sampling, some of these sequences that match some of the pangolin, the known coronaviruses that have been pulled mm. directly from pangolins, again, sort of adds a little bit to that um, trail of breadcrumbs um, from an evolutionary standpoint. And so, um, yeah, we're still in our infancy, actually, of understanding how these viruses are moving and what the kind of um, parallel evolution that can happen that might increase spillover, um, really important topics that were, that sometimes I think get pushed to the margins. The other thing that is totally pushed to the margins are the other classes of coronaviruses, which are again, really prolific. And we've kind of, for obvious reasons, put a lot of our attention into the SARS-like viruses. The authors lift up another kind of um, clade or another branch point on the tree here to these um, so-called SADS viruses. So this is um, a diarrheal syndrome, um, severe acute diarrheal syndrome virus. Uh, some hints that this has been bubbling up um, through uh, agriculture. So some herds of um, pigs, of swine, where we've seen a few outbreaks um, of SADS virus, sort of a distant cousin of the SARS viruses. And here, you know, the authors are pointing out exactly what you brought up, Vincent, some of that same um, evolution in the spike where some of the residues that so thinking about the binding to human receptors, there could be some hints that this is something that's being sort of natural selection is litigating in this case, perhaps through pigs, but something that I think should be on our radar, um, is not just SARS like viruses, but SADS like viruses. When we think about the recombination that's happening, that's another one that I think is, um, you know, in the, um, running for a, a future pandemic and again is i think really understudied under considered and should be in our conversations as evolutionary virologists um and hopefully will not be in our the reason so why should it be again if evolutionary um you know virologists are talking about this or learning about this the best case scenario is that we uh put it some surveillance in place um on farms and other sort of collision points with humans and in this case with pigs and that we're able to stop something before it really gets out of, out of hand. Um, whether we you know, have the resources or the wherewithal to, to really do that is another question, but uh, at least from sort of the evolutionist perspective, I think this is one of our um, best chances to try to get out ahead of some of this by understanding the biology, understanding the virology um, before we sort of are playing catch up and um, you know, deploying other measures that um, later in the game when a pandemic is already starting to move through human populations. I also like the uh, the modeling where they show the distribution of these rhinolophus species throughout Asia, which really emphasizes the widespread nature. And you know, they they they're all over the place, and they can carry. And we have barely sampled them. So, uh, Southeast Asia, South Laos, Vietnam, Southern China, uh, India, these bats are all over the place, and they could harbor similar viruses. So. Uh, the idea that this arose somewhere in these areas is not unusual, I think. Yeah, agreed. And I think that's an important perspective to have, too. I mean, so there's been, a, of course, in the news headlines and other places, a lot of consideration of um, a few kilometers around Wuhan, whether it's the Wuhan Institute for Virology, the wildlife wet markets, things like mm -hmm. that. But again, we're that's a, kind of almost, um, you know, potentially wearing blinders to, of just focusing in on that small area. And so... Yeah, I think it's really important to think about this in the bigger geographical perspective and 
Um, and, and honestly, not just where are the bats, but where are the humans and how, you know, how many collisions are really happening here? Again, uh, the level of, um, you know, knowledge here is, is for, given that vast landscape is, is pretty modest at this step. We, we know very little. We're just glimpsing at this for the first time. Got a good question here about um, ecology. Bats share trees with nocturnal arboreal mammals. How can we sample these wild mammals? Yeah, that's a great question. And so um, I think it's tricky, you know, it's actually looking at the methods here of this paper, um, a lot of ecologists, I think, are pretty, you know, they ha so it's not a, a trivial thing to go out and actually collect these samples. You have to do this safely um, and you have to have all of your permits together. And so I think, you know, we have experts, um, in this case, some of the authors here for doing this among bats. But so are we, um, you know, teaming up? Uh, with other experts who, uh, ma mammologists in this case, who um, might be working with um, some of these other species, I think that's a really great point. It's a really important, um, r a really important uh, sort of future direction because currently, you know, you'll get these if you only exclusively sample in bats, and then you might pull out some sequences that, when you put it into a tree, is like most closely related to a pangolin, a civet, a raccoon dog, etc. Um, but then. Um, it, that's sort of an inference where you haven't directly sampled. So you're one step away or even maybe two steps yeah. away. And so, yeah, this is a really great um, question. It's a really great, I think, important direction ahead is how as eco how do we ecologists team up um, with evolutionary virologists, et cetera, in order to do these more comprehensive studies. I hope that we see um, more studies like that. Again, really tough to even just get these samples in the first place. This has also become, I think, harder and harder. This, you know, so this sampling was done as we pointed out back in um, before the pandemic and so it was already underway imagine trying to launch a study like this today given the um you know political considerations um some of the back and forth that's happened um between scientists in different countries um are you know the leaders have uh taken some pretty made some pretty dr drastic statements that have and for and i'm not you know trying to cast blame here. I'm just, it's a complicated situation. It's become more complicated in the last year or so. Um, but those, I think this is a great question. These are exactly the kind of studies we need moving forward. And so I hope that there is a way forward. I mean, we have to collaborate across many countries and with the current atmosphere of accusation, that's not encouraging it, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah, science works right. by, by collaboration across countries all the time. And so by being antagonistic in the absence of data, it's not a good thing. So, I mean, as Nell says, yeah, we need to do more sampling and, and these other animals as well. Because as you know, uh, for SARS-1, the civet was the intermediary between bats and humans. And so there are ample opportunities for cross-species infection, especially with a mobile species like bats, right? So we need to look yeah. at it. And there's a big geographical range involved here as... Uh, as Rad also points out, this uh, Yunnan is near uh, the northern portion of the Mekong River. The ecosystem should be almost identical. Well, I don't know if they're identical, but they're probably, you know, harboring s the same bats it says something, right? Yep. Yeah, right, very good questions. Good points. Yep. Anything else on this paper, Nels? I think that about covers it. You know, our take home here, I think, is the there's these we're just glimpsing at these vast natural oh, reservoirs of coronaviruses versus, yeah. I think, a conversation that often kind of considers a few small samples in a, in a handful of laboratories. And the mismatch between that, I think, is is worth remembering. It's worth trying to, to gain a little bit of that perspective. Yeah, I mean, we have so much more to do here. Uh, it's kind of sad that we're not able to do it. Oh, well. All right, so let's now move forward. So the um, next paper that we're covering is um, a really interesting one that you pulled out, Vincent. I'm glad you grabbed onto this one. So it's <laughs> the title of the paper is Dating First Cases of COVID-19. Um, I think this is a nice example of how, um, again, sort of, um, you know, scientists with different backgrounds sort of bringing expertise in, I think, thoughtful ways to some of the questions mm -hmm. at hand here. So again, um, this is uh, closer to conservation biology. The authors, David Roberts, Jeremy Ras Rossman, and Ivan, um, Ivan Jarek uh, at the University of Kent in the UK. And so here what they're doing, it's a, a quick note, this is in PLOS Genetics um, and uh, available open source 
Uh, and I should mention that last paper we covered, Cell, even though it's a subscription journal, the um, the work that we were, were looking at is open access. So people should be able to get to that even if you don't have a subscription. Plus Genetics is open access. Um, and the authors, I think, just kind of crystallize what they've done here in this sentence where they say, we've repurposed extinction models from conservation science to estimate the potential for earlier cases that have been then have been reported of COVID-19 in 200 plus countries and territories. And so this is really kind of interesting. So this is the um, technique they're using here. It's called optimal linear estimation or OLE. Right. And the way this has usually been deployed is for if you're in conservation biology and you're working <laughs> on um, a species that you think is near extinction or might be extinct, excuse me, you take the recent sightings of it. So, you know, this has been I love some of the, um, you know, crowdsourcing of this in recent years. I don't know if you're, have you run into this um, program called iNaturalist, Vincent? I have not. I have not, no. Yeah. So this is really cool. It's an app and mm -hmm. you can go out in your neighborhood with your um, iPhone or related smartphone. And um, if you see a really cool bug or animal or plant, you take a snap a photo of it. You, have, you geolocate uh, yes, it yes. and it gets identified yeah. by, you know, the, the public. And so you get, that's a sighting. Uh, most of these are not species that are near extinction. These are like, you know, um, bumblebees and things like that, which is natural bees, I think, are really interesting. But anyway, um, in this case, you know, it might be a rare woodpecker. And in five years time, it might have been seen five years ago, 10 times, three years ago, three times, last mm -hmm. year only once. And so these models are meant to try to estimate whether that given the um, number of sightings in the trajectory there, when a species might actually be extinct. So this has kind of been reversed mm -hmm. um, for thinking about <laughs> COVID-19. Yeah, and it's yeah. like all of the reports, right, of cases that have been recorded publicly in many countries over the last um, year plus, um, you know, looking at the acceleration of them. So at the beginning of the pandemic, you had in February one case, in March two cases, et cetera, and then more. And then you work backwards from that to, to ask, mm -hmm. okay, when did the first one maybe happen in the first place? A right. really clever um, use of that, um, you know, model in a new way. And so the take home here, I would say, is that there are, you know, um, Contrary to some of the very the some of the very original ideas of oh yeah it was the Wuhan wet market back in December of 2019, that in fact, it's maybe um, you know earlier in the fall, yeah so November maybe in November pu pushing it back a month forward or so, you know the evolutionary um, virologists mm -hmm. sort of the genomic epidemiologists have used have also used. Um, different methods based on building trees and trying to work back to that time to the um, last common ancestor um, mm -hmm. and have, I think, also, um, you know, proposed some very similar time points. And then as it's moved to different countries, that actually, you know, not surprisingly, I would say, um, some of the first cases reported were probably the, there almost no question that SARS-2 was um, circulating, especially given um, how much asymptomatic spread there is. And so this, again, helps to t try to make something invisible more visible. Um, and I think interesting to see this complementary approach to some of the more classic evolutionary approaches and how that's sort of converging on pushing back um, by a month or two, um, you know, the time that we might pr uh, think of when the, and this is important because already I think there's been a lot of evidence that the wet, you know, certainly there were cases in and around the wet market at the end of 2019, but that's not where SARS-2 started. It was sort of circulating invisibly before that in humans and obviously a point of great contention and interest um, as well. What are the origins of the virus? Again, going from the science and very quickly swirling in um, beyond that to, and not just public health, but also politics um, as people are debating um, sort of, I think with renewed energy, the whole origins, is this a natural occurrence, a spillover from these vast natural reservoirs of viruses, or is this something that was in the la one laboratory nearby in Wuhan and it it somehow escaped um, from the lab, obviously a, a big conversation going on. So I, I picked this now because the, the last time on Twivo we talked about the Kumar paper where they right. used a different clocking approach to say, the, they, they identified a precursor pro-CoV-2, I think they called it. That's which right. they think uh, was circulating in October slash November uh, 2019. And this is 
it's a similar idea, right? So there are two independent ways of looking at it, and they both come up with sort of the same time frame. Yeah, and I really like this, you know, just not just for obviously COVID-19, but for all of science is can you take complement, you know, different approaches and build evidence that might put you in the, you know, in the same territory using different approaches. That's the one. And for evolution, this is really important, actually, because you don't always we don't have the time machines. We can't go back and, you know, nail it, nail, you know, yeah, something. Yeah. We're making a lot of inferences as soon as we're talking about evolution. And so one of the strategies to make more robust conclusions or to advance our knowledge is to take complementary approaches and then see whether they start to give the similar answers or the same answers. It sort of strengthens the inference when by independent means you come right. to the same conclusions. Now, of course, you know, you have to be when we're colleagues are reviewing a paper like this, of course, we're are trying to be sure they're not cherry picking. Are they making their model match? <laughs> what's already sort of out for public consumption or is this independently getting in? So you're reading very closely how the model works and seeing that it is sort of a fair um, comparison here. And in this case, it looks like that is the, the case, that this is a complementary approach that's sort of finding similar um, conclusions. And that starts to, that's, that's how you, I think, build um, knowledge for a field that depends on inferences is using complementary approaches. It's almost like building a circumstantial case in mm -hmm. a sense in this case, from a biological perspective. Yeah, this is really cool. I'm glad you brought this one forward, Vincent, a good one so to think this about. Is, I also think this is important because there have been a few reports, I think mainly out of Italy, suggesting an earlier circulation than we really thought of. And, you know, those were usually dismissed, but in light of these new recalculations, they might make sense. And so you know, I think it's worth looking uh, at, at samples. And we actually have a question here from Mark who says, what could we hmm. learn by you know, studying blood samples over decades. I think if you have them, not every blood bank stores samples forever, but if you have them, uh, you could, well, you'd have to look for something, right? You can't just blindly look, but if you say, let's yeah. find, let's see the earliest evidence of SARS-CoV-2 infection, you could do antibody uh, assays and, and look at that. And I think it's worth doing earlier than we think, right? Absolutely right. I actually, so I think this is a great, point. It's a great question. Those techniques, you know, have their limitations too. And so this is another way of like the more kind of um, strategies you take to tackle the question along these lines, the better. But, you know, it's, it's then weighing what are the strengths of that approach and what are the drawbacks. And for the antibody testing, you know, I think you have some potential pitfalls. So the specificity um, yeah, of the sure, response, sure. Um, just how the test is working, false positives mm -hmm, yeah. um, come online pretty quickly. And so that's where calibrating against, um, the oil, in this case, this um, conservation biology, this extinction model, calibrating mm -hmm. against the more um, traditional phylogenetic approaches, last common ancestor kind of time to um, most recent common ancestor um, which, which also, I think the, you know, the issue there is resolution. So your confidence intervals, 95% confidence intervals on a date end up being pretty big. Like it's not just mm -hmm. a month or two in each direction. And so you're kind of, you know, each, yeah, each approach has, but that's where I think, yeah, more surveillance along these lines makes sense. And not just for SARS too, this gets back to that bigger question, which is, you know, in Southeast Asia in particular, where coronaviruses are endemic, um, are, what are the collisions looking like um, from the general public? And so if you frame the question carefully, and it's not just sort of where did SARS-2 come from, but what are what are the um, you know immune systems, what have, what's been perked up immunologically speaking um, in folks that come through blood, blood banks, there could be some real valuable knowledge gained from that. Mm -hmm. And again, we're sort of, I would say, in our infancy of really starting to bring that kind of surveillance to bear. And it has some challenges too. It has some some drawbacks, but um, sure. I think worth advancing and, and, you know, putting more scientific resources, more energy in that space for sure. All right. So that's um, number two on our sampling platter. Should we move forward? You bet. To the next one. Okay. So this one, now we're going to kind of move. So we're, we've kind of gone from that, all of that vast natural reservoirs that we're just glimpsing at into thinking about SARS-2. Um, and, oh, hold on. We've got a question from Penny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So thanks, Penny. The um, distracting kind of conspiracy theory um, whiteboard behind me. And I have to confess, this has kind of become more of like a um, 
you know, a canvas for a static work of art. It's almost, I think some of the dry erase marker is now frozen. It's become permanent ink, almost like an oil paint on here. I don't know if I can, how much of this I can erase. Um, I'm hoping to do a lab office <laughs> renovation though in a couple of months. We're going to just paint over it. We're going to start over um, and put a different kind of whiteboard here. So, um, but there are, there's some real science back there. I think there's some great ideas. Um, it's just as confusing to me by now as probably most of you trying to glimpse at all those scribbles back there. But anyway, so uh, moving to our third paper and we're now really, um, I think going to contend with a little bit of um, th some of the, um, you know, political conversation in a sense, or some of the controversy, let's say, of the SARS-2 origins here. And so we're looking at a preprint. This is from um, our, my colleague, Jesse Bloom, also a science buddy um, as well, just to put that out there, um, all kinds of respect for Jesse. Um, he really kind of um, whipped up a, a news storm here in the last week when he um, revealed this preprint. It's entitled Recovery of Deleted Deep Sequencing Data Sheds More Light on the Early Wuhan SARS-2 Epidemic. And so maybe just to set this up, there's actually already a version 2.0. So just last night, Jesse updated this based on some sort of real time or really quick peer review um, that, and I should say, involves a postdoc who works in my group, Stephen Goldstein, who um, was very interested in Jesse's preprint, read it very closely, and I think offered some really nice um, feedback that Jesse, um, to his credit, has now updated based on sort of Stephen's comments and, and the comments from several others. But um, you and know, I so took this... out the reference to TWIV. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the first version had a reference to a discussion with Bob Gary on TWIV. And, oh, interesting. Um, yeah. They took it out because so so Jesse had said that Bob's idea that uh, there were two markets involved was wrong, but it's not wrong. It's actually correct. And so they maybe he realized that and they took it out. And that with that goes the reference to TWIV. It was my first citation, you know, <laughs> <the scientific paper. laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, sort of the, um, you know, pitfalls of peer review in real time here, I guess. That's but right. That's right. Anyway. So, you know, I have just, to say, right? Nels, just yeah. full disclosure. Please. Yes. So yesterday uh, on a TWIV that's not yet released, Bob Gary and Christian Anderson came on and talked about this preprint. Oh, fantastic. Okay. I'm not going to tell you what they said until I hear what you have to say, though. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. So, and this, but this actually does deserve conversation. Um, and, uh, you know, and so how did Jesse get onto this? Maybe let's start there just for a minute or two. And so, um, Jesse, like many other scientists, um, evolutionary virologists, really interested in trying to trace where did this virus come from? And so, you know, it's pretty obvious that in order, the bet we can get better, we can do better, we can do better. Our inferences can be stronger with the more sequences that we have. And so we already talked about that in that first paper, right? We would love to have more sequences. In this case, kind of coming at it from the other direction, which is all of the SARS-2-like viruses um, in the wild and bats. Here we're moving in the other direction. We know we've sampled now millions of sequences of the uh, SARS-2 genomes from human patients. Um, but we're working backwards to that sort of that first spillover or the emergence, the origins of the virus and trying to like work, you know, backwards to get more sequences from patients that were infected very early in the pandemic. And so this puts us in the Wuhan area or in and around Wuhan um, back in the fall of 2019. And so Jesse's been sort of, um, you know, scouring the internet, looking at sequence repositories. So there's a, in the NIH runs a database called the Sequence Read Archive. And so anytime you sequence, not just viruses, anytime you do a big sequencing genome scale sequencing project, especially for NIH funded work, you'll deposit these sequences at the SRA. And in a lot of cases, that's sort of a requirement for journals, um, a requirement data sharing um, for receiving grants, et cetera. And so this has become this massive repository for all kinds of sequences, whether it's a virus, a, a monkey, a pangolin, anything. Um, my own lab, we've made many SRA deposits, um, and that's not unusual at all. And so here, a group um, made some deposits of um, some early SARS-2 sequences recovered from patients. They published a paper um, in a journal, kind of a techniques paper, on how to, um, to get the, to, to genotype these sequences, sort of a, a, a step forward in that um, space. Um, geared partic particularly for SARS-2. And as part of that, they did do, deposit a number of sequences in the sequence read archive. Then 
that um, a request was made by those researchers to delete that. The, there's an email. Jesse sort of linked that into the preprint, especially in the second version. It's a little more um, uh, put a little bit more forward where the researchers ask to remove that um, data set and then claim that they're going to, you know, they're working on putting some more together and then they'll submit those. And I don't think those have been submitted, but this isn't in and of itself. This isn't. Um, it doesn't look like nefarious activity. You know, scientists yeah. are moving around. Of course, now <laughs> fast forward a year and a half forward, and all of a sudden we're kind of scouring, looking for stuff, and things can kind of people are, I think, really in the mood. Um, in some cases, for political reasons, to connect the dots here, and to try to um, ascribe sort of more, um, you know, nefarious or sort of purposeful outcomes, a cover up, conspiracy, all of these kind of things, as we, as people are weighing the natural versus lab origins of SARS-2. So anyways, but Jesse was able to recover, even though this was that data set was taken away, he was able to recover nine sequences from the cloud. So this is kind of the world we live in now. Even when you delete <laughs> things from the internet, there's sort of a backup somewhere. And so that's really the advance here. Jesse was actually able to recover some of these sequences. Now, really important, I think, to say that the data that these sequences had, in, in particular, three mutations that are different from some of the other early genomes that were acquired, um, that wasn't taken off the record. So actually that group that published this paper, um, they had a table that said, here are the mutations. So, you know, that was also a, a preprint. Um, it's been pointed out that you can't retract a preprint, which is great. Um, once it's on the record, it's on the record. This is also published, the paper wasn't retracted. And so there's a little bit of this mismatch between, you know, is something going on here? Or someone is trying to hide something versus um, this is just, kind of a slightly sloppy um, uh, report of the data. And so I think Jesse, um, you know, very much said this, uh, his work that he put forward, he isn't taking, he doesn't think that the data points in one way or another to um, any of the sort of origin ideas that are being uh, kind of litigated in real time. But of course, we don't live in a world of sort of neutral, let's say, way sort of scientific evidence carefully and in a balanced way, we live in a world where a lot of people have, in a lot of cases, political motivations to try to drive a narrative one way or another. And I would say this is kind of picked up in that firestorm in some unfort unfortunate ways. Yeah, so the, the, um, the removal of the sequence, I think, is completely, uh, un it's not a problem. It's not nefarious in any way. I think the, the author's intended to move it somewhere else, and that's fine. But the key is that the, the Wang et al., which was a preprint, and now it's published in the journal Small, I think is the name of it. Uh, all the SNPs are there that Jesse recovered and talked about. So these are single nucleotide polymorphisms that distinguish the different isolates. The rest of the genomes are the same. And we should say they're not complete genomes. They're small fragments of, of spike and some other downstream uh, genes. Uh, the, the SNPs are all there in the table. So... Um, this, there's nothing hidden, really. Just the rest of the sequence isn't there, but it doesn't matter because it's all the same in all the isolates. No, that's a good point. And, and actually, in Jesse's, you know, um, to his credit, he cites that paper in the preprint. But it was, you know, in that version 1.0, it was a little bit buried, actually. And so that was one of yeah. some of the feedback that he got, uh, including from Stephen from my lab, was that, you know, you might want to put that up a little bit closer to the front of the conversation because, honestly, you know, the bandwidth. So, so first we're depending on maybe a, a pretty large non-science audience um, to sort of carefully consider an entire, um, you know, body of work here. And just the attention spans of a lot of people, maybe not. And so anyway, so how do you, in, in normal scientific practice, it's not unusual to cite something, but you know, you're, you as part of what we do as scientists is you want to be in the conversation, you want to sort of make the case that what I found is new, it's novel. Mm. And so oftentimes when you cite something, it, it might be, you know, it's there, but you're not sort of highlighting that. And so um, I think in this case, because this isn't just sort of science as usual, this is also wrapped up in a, in a much bigger conversation that, um, you know, glad to see actually in version 2.0 that that's that information that you were just mentioning, um, Vincent, that's totally public and available. Um, yeah, that should be, <laughs> I think in version 1.0, that should have maybe been, yeah. Um, yeah a little better presentation there, given um, the weird sort of cross currents of, of um, interpretations that that we're seeing unfold in real time. 
Um, you know, Jesse's point is still valid, which is that um, it, when you're trying to build phylogenetic trees, it just is easier if you have all of the data. But that, but the, this isn't data hiding. And again, you know, I think it's also important. I think what's been lost from the conversation is okay, if you take these nine sequences or other ones like them, there might be, you know, even another fifty or hundred or two hundred out there, and mm-hmm. then put that into the phylogenetic analysis. Does that give us any? Um, you know, important information um, in terms of uh, the point that we were talking about earlier, the rooting of the tree. Does this give us any important information about um, the origins of the virus? And in that sense, you know, actually adding those three mutations, and if my, if my memory is correct, those three mutations actually look, um, even though they're recovered in humans, it's almost like this evolutionary walk where it looks more like a bat virus based on just if you line up those three changes. And so, um, or, or actually it's the other way around. So some sequences recovered later, look more bat like, um, at those three positions. And, but that's not unusual for virus evolution. These things are, you know, as we've talked about are constantly mutating mm-hmm. and changing. And so you kind of have this, um, every change does not mean that you've adapted more to a human, a bat, a pangolin, or some other potential host. There's just all of this noise, um, evolutionary yeah. noise, yeah. Um, of genetic changes. And so this, sort of illustrates a little bit of that noise, perhaps. It doesn't put us anywhere. I don't think it doesn't change the conversation about, um, which is already, I think, the kind of you know prevailing idea has been that the wet market in Wuhan wasn't where this thing emerged based on some of the data that we've just been talking about, right? Which is um, the estimates based on extinction or phylogenetics time to let, and pushing that back a month or more before. And so in that sense, this really didn't move the needle. And Jesse says that, but then of course, I think what really gets swept up is the notion that, oh, he found deleted sequences. It's sort of this detective story. And then it starts to feed into like that very human impulse of who's hiding what. And I think that's where unfortunately things have gone, you know, in some cases a little off the rails. Yeah. I mean, that was the conclusion from yesterday that we need more sequences from early in the outbreak. And that's good that we have these, but these don't really change our perspective of what happened. Um, And that the first version of the manuscript had unfortunate tone to it, which was accusatory, right? And it wasn't appropriate. You should just present the data neutrally. And I hope, and I hope this, the second version and whatever is published and, and Christian did say this should be published uh, because we need the data to be out there. But Christian also said that, um, uh, the the um, the mark you know there were two lineages circulating early in Wuhan and only one was found at the Huanan market and he said that could be it wasn't there or we just didn't sample enough right yeah. and so concluding that those are not close enough to the bat is in, inappropriate because we don't have the data to do that which is yeah. you know what Jesse has done in at least version one and he says it's not appropriate because there just isn't enough data and it's very very tricky and. Um, so we, we end up yeah. not being any more advanced than where we were, but it's and still we need to have more sequences. So No, that's right. And so I would actually, if I were peer reviewing this, I guess we're doing podcast peer review, as we usually do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I would propose a slight um, change to the title. So the title, if you recall, is Recovery of Deleted Deep Sequencing Data Sheds More Light on the Early Wuhan SARS-2, SARS-CoV-2 Epidemic. I would actually change just one word instead of light. Um, heat. So recovery of deleted deep sequencing sheds more heat on the early Wuhan SARS-2 pandemic, because what this has done, I don't think we've learned a lot more scientifically, but we've definitely turned up the kind of volume of controversy and kind of rancor um, about what's going on here. And I think, Hmm. you know, science, we're hoping to do more light than heat. But in this case, I think we got more heat than light. And I'm not trying, you know, I'm actually, as I said, um, friends and colleagues with Jesse. And so I'm not, uh, I actually, and, and there's another point here I want to make that I don't, that I, that I haven't heard yet that I think is actually a bit important here. And again, this is taking a little bit of a bigger perspective is that, you know, there's another false narrative out there, which is that scientists have decided that it has to be a natural occurrence and there's no um, room at all for any other that the scientists, it's sort of a religion now for scientists. It's almost like we've been indoctrinated into a natural origin. And so I think what this demonstrates is that there are serious scientists out there where that's not the case. We're still very much pursuing more information 
um, not kind of taking it on faith that we have enough information to make definitive conclusions. And so that's not coming um, exclusively from outside the scientific community. Many members of the scientific community conducting the scientific process as usual. The more evidence we get, the we, we you know moving forward in, with an open mind, a little bit closer to the truth all of the time. But this has been taken way out of perspective um, beyond that part of the conversation. And so um, anyway, uh, <laughs> worth discussing, but a really tricky topic here. Yeah, it's, a, it's really unfortunate because the press can't parse this out at all. And um, it ends up looking nefarious and it's anything but that. And as the, the conclusion was yesterday, okay, it doesn't really change our picture, but it's interesting to have these sequences. So I think we have to be driven by the data now. That's what scientists do. We're always open to uh, changing ideas uh, depending on what the data say. So as, as Christian said yesterday, um, there are no data for a lab origin. There are no data, yeah. but if there are, let's see them. Right, right now, yeah, no, you said exactly. there's a lot of data for for natural origin, so it's not like we're wedded, as you said. We just are driven by the data, and that's where it's pushing that's, us. That's exactly right. And in terms of the data, I would point back to that first paper, right? So, so why is it that a lot of scientists are, um, you know, it, it's not a sort of a fifty fifty. Um, given our limited data so far, a lot of scientists don't think it's 50-50. That's in part because it, it's not obvious, but there's all of this invisible virological action happening all around us. Bat populations are teeming with coronaviruses that are sampling spikes that can bind human ACE2. Um, and so that's where the limited evidence is sort of pointing so far. But that doesn't mean the case is closed. And I'm, I'm sure we'll have more conversations ahead. Um, along these lines. But I think it is important to note the difference here between that scientific approach, which I think has been really taken out of context. I mean, so locally, um, and I've been using the word politics here. So I um, saw uh, my own representative in the House of Representatives here in the US, um, who, um, you know, represents me not because of any vote that I cast in his direction, let me just say to be a little bit <laughs> diplomatic. But that we are um, give you know with this information like that that Jesse put forward here that we need to con quote unquote connect the dots and realize that this is a lab leak covered up by communist China, and you know and so the GOP and I think in the last twenty four hours forty eight hours have called sort of a pseudo committee together to hammer away on Tony Fauci and other scientists um, to kind of claim that we've been covering this all up and that we're in kind of cahoots with the Chinese government somehow. And so, you know, that's really, I think, where our political leadership is falling, not just falling short on the evidence that's in front of us, but is actually using this in really unfortunate ways that's going to make things worse in the longer run. It might be great strategy for getting elected in a year and a half when you have other things that you're trying to sort of get people to not pay attention to. But this is a disaster for public health. This is a disaster for us taking care of each other in communities, in neighborhoods. And so I feel like I'm not represented at all in the House of Representatives because of how some of this information is being twisted in ways that are, I mean, that's, that's pretty nefarious, actually, to take the information we have and to advance it in a way that just doesn't fit the evidence. And so that's why I think under just under the surface, you have a, um, a lot of scientists a little pissed off right now, myself included, about how some of the politics is being spun here. That, that's about as angry as you'll see Nels get. By the way. <laughs> that's so right. Carl says uh, it takes a long time to track where a virus jumped. I don't think the media has any grasp at all how long that takes. It took almost 10 years for SARS-1, and we really did not have the actual virus that jumped over. We just knew sort of where it came from, right? It's not easy. Yeah, it's not easy. It's not easy. These things are invisible. And, the, you know, the best work that we we're doing so far is really just barely scratching the surface. It's, it's, a, yep. a, it's a, a really good point. Agree. All right. Other points on our sampling menu of papers? I think that brings us up to date. It's amazing how fast this is all moving. So I'm just thinking, you know, um, to episode 68 of... Um, of Tuivo, and this is before we're now kind of in this world of Greek letter variants. So we were we were talking about a paper <laughs> that sort of proposed another 
um, Greek alphabet kind of approach. That's been sort of, I, I think, you know, it wasn't taken up, but there's a new, the World Health Organization has brought forward. We're no longer talking in our um, B.1.617.2 lineage. We're talking about the Delta variant. And, um, uh, and, and obviously that's also kind of, come, I think we'll talk about that actually in our picks of the week here in, in, in a few minutes, but um, mm -hmm. amazing how fast this is all moving. And I think um, you know, it actually, some of the feedback we've been getting on Twivo, of course, uh, both Vince and I would love to return to, um, some more evolutionary, um, biology outside of the SARS-2 pandemic. But of course we're still, I think there's a lot, um, to process here. And I, and I hope these conversations will help us to, um, process this in an open and, um, in uh, open way and, and to encourage more feedback and conversation. Um, among scientists, among the general public, among all of us. And so that's why we're still um, kind of focused here. Uh, we have a, a guest who's usually on the evening live stream with Amy, overjoyed. Uh, well, you know, it's good that you can't leave it. That, I love it. I love <laughs> when people get into science. That's the key here. That's what we're trying to do. Absolutely right. <laughs> yep. And Someone I think, else you know, that's... has said that uh, some people are in the UK. They said this is a good hour to podcast because it's uh, 7 p.m. there, right? And uh, yeah. No, that's really great. And, um, you know, I think one of the reasons we're doing that is to try to broaden out that conversation and to put this into some perspective because, you know, yeah, the news headlines that we're seeing kind of bubbling up. Uh, we don't have all the answers here, but hopefully, you know, even some t uh, talking to people who are kind of coming at this in different directions and trying to put this together a little bit into some perspective um, and by the way, this is a conversation that we can't just have scientists have this conversation. It has to be a bigger conversation um, f for us to make sense of this and for us to process this and to, to kind of step through this in hopefully some positive ways. But I would say in the U.S. at least, um, you know, some real headwinds in terms of the politics that are, are being sort of um, put forward or I think leveraged based on some really limited data or misusing the data that's in front of us to be pretty blunt, try to be blunt about it. Yeah. All right. Well, should we move to the mailbag? Yeah. Well, unfortunately, the mailbag is small because I think people are asking their <laughs> questions these days on the live stream, which is great. Which is great. Yeah. Please, um, more of that. But we, and you know, we can uh, do the one email because I think it's relevant. Definitely. Do you want to, want to take that, Nels? I will. So Anthony writes, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. And the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop. A hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. Um, Biblical passage, passage there from uh, Anthony. <laughs> in the talk of variants, and now bringing this <laughs> back to the virology, in the talk of variants and increased transmissibility, I don't see anything about the social environment. SARS-CoV-2 doesn't hitch a ride on a mosquito or the wind or water. The infected need to do the legwork to transmit the virus. If a variant simply is functional and finds itself in a supercharged social environment, um, cases with that variant will skyrocket. An uber mutation by some yardstick is going to be gone if it arises somewhere um, in someone who cuts off all the contact for what it's worth. Yeah, thanks, Anthony, for weighing in. And I think that's a pretty um, obvious analogy here, right? So you're talking about that mm -hmm. supercharged variant, um, but perhaps that has been planted, so to speak, um, along the path or was um, eaten by a bird or some of those rocky places as opposed to the fertile soil. And and absolutely, yes. I mean, so that's part of the um, sort of, the, again, the trickiness of this conversation is we have all of this complex virology, all of the, the transmission lines that don't just involve a few mutations in a virus um, or sort of the, you know, even receptor binding or other sort of biological or cell biological um, parts of the infectivity profile for how these viruses replicate. We also have, uh, as part of these transmission cycles, are what are the hosts doing? How many contacts are there? Um, all of, you know, some of the features of what infections look like in the host, whether it's asymptomatic, super spreader events is every, uh, maybe that sort of fits into the analogy of the 
fertile soil versus the path. If, if the virus hits a super spreader, someone who is, for whatever reason, ends up um, being highly contagious, um, that's a, another sort of variable here, and it gets complicated in a hurry. Mm-hmm. Let me bring up a couple of chat questions here. Uh, this one, we keep samples from March, but our institution cannot sequence them. Is there any interest for them to be sent somewhere? So I don't know what samples you mean, Jivka. Um, Probably SARS-2 uh, from patients, nasa, I'm guessing. Nasopharyngeal yep. samples, blood, I don't know. Um, but um, there, there are many labs that are doing. See, I would contact Christian Anderson or Pardis Sabiti at Harvard and uh, see if they want to uh, take a look at them, depending on what they are, right? Yeah, that's right. And even, you know, in addition, like one of the things that we've learned sort of as um, virologists working kind of in fundamental virology or fundamental questions is also these contacts or, or building new contacts with um, public health outfits um, who are also interested, in, obviously, not only in, um, or and this has sort of extended their reach or their interests, not just from sort of contact tracing, but also doing some of this genomic epidemiology. And so a lot of departments of public health have brought in sort of new capacity to do sequencing. So it really depends, I think, on your local environment. And so even if your institution mm. um, might not have some of those resources, are there others, you know, other kind of local entities that might have that? I think honestly, you know, in some sense, um, it, the question becomes like, what will these samples maybe add to the conversation? So how much sampling has already been done in and around these localities um, o over these time frames? And I think, you know, I don't know, what number we're at now, but I heard that recently GISAID, which is a major repository mm -hmm. for SARS-2 sequences now, sort of repurposed from its original um, influenza virus collecting, is now more than 2 million um, sequences yeah. over the course of the year plus of the pandemic. And so then the question becomes, you know, yeah, what if we put more resources into sequencing at different points, is there a reason to do that? Is there a hole there? Would that sort of help to inform us. And there's, that's another, you know, we've talked about this a little bit. I think that's another really important point that, to bring up is we've never done this before where we've sequenced the genomes mm -hmm. of so many viruses from so Man. many people over a short amount of time. And it's, you know, an inc it's incredibly powerful to have those resources, but at the same time, do we keep that perspective? Like how much do we really learn from doing more sequencing versus um, sort of understanding some of the the biology here. And that's a, you know, I think that's an important um, consideration too, that sometimes gets I, lost. I totally agree. I think in fact, we don't know what to do with much of the sequence, right? Uh, we can use it to track. <clears throat> we can say, where did this come from? But in terms of biological relevance, I think it's really hard. The experiments take many years to do. And in fact, someone said that here, let me pr bring up that I can't get over the more transmissible claim without experimental proof. Yes, that's the point. There's no experimental proof, and it takes time to do that. And there's no, hasn't been done. Took four years to chase solar eclipses to prove, prove Einstein's theory. Um, <laughs> I also wanted to thank Elizabeth for your contribution. You guys can support Microbe TV if you like what we do. And also Sandy, thank you very much. We appreciate your support. Wow, um, thank you. Uh, Natalia, you're Brazilian in the UK supporting early podcasts. So, you know, I've always tried to figure <laughs> out what time would be good. You know, Australia never works well. Australia and Asia, <laughs> you can never get a good time for them. Uh, yeah. But for Europe for, and South America, for sure. I'm trying to figure out a good time because I want to do more of this from the new studio. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, I, don't, I want to get as many people as possible. So I'm afraid I'm going to leave out the, uh, the Australians. Um, now, Max said, read my question longer up, but there are many, Max, and, and uh, why don't you come tonight? And they're all kind of biological, related to things that we don't talk about here on, on Tuivo. So um, uh, if you could do that tonight, that would be fine. Otherwise, put one question in now that you want us to answer. Mm, Is the Delta yep. variant much more dangerous? No, it's it's not at all <laughs> much more dangerous. Um <laughs> You know, it, it's, it spreads very easily. It has a fitness advantage over other uh, ancestral viruses, but there's no evidence that it's more dangerous. And I really don't know why that dominates the narrative. In fact, the vaccines work. They prevent serious disease caused by Delta. And so just get vaccinated, right? And yeah. I don't quite understand it. 
I think we'll talk a bit more. That's another, I think, really good example of how sometimes, you know, so we have this mountain of evidence, we see genetic changes, and then ascribe that to variants, and then really try to put that together um, with the, you know, the very short time of as we're seeing outbreaks, right? And famously for the Delta variant yeah, in yeah. India, the UK. And so, um, and then conflating that with, um, yeah, so Elizabeth, exactly right. The transmissible conversation gets confusing. The disease is transmitting more, but we haven't proven it because the virus is biology. And that's because exactly right. We talk about transmission and sort of conflate that with it has to be a biological situation. Um, and but at the same time, you know, sometimes the I think we're our conversations are it's really hard. And maybe this is why podcasting, I think, is important because we're we have the, the time, the bandwidth to, to dig into this in those kind of one sentences or short essays, et cetera. It can feel a little bit black and white where it's like yeah, it has yeah. to be all of the biology of the virus or it has to be all of, you know, how humans are colliding or letting down some of the the measures um, uh, to prevent virus spread. And it's probably somewhere in between and, and we need to know and we need to have these conversations, but I think we're not served well by it has to be X or it has to be Y or it has to be Z when it could be a mm -hmm. little bit of X, Y, and Z all integrated together. And so, and that means that, yeah. So in, I mean, I a hundred percent agree with Vincent's take home, which is good. If you haven't become, become vaccinated, this is, you know, or, how are we working to get vaccines distributed globally? How are we working? How are we putting energy and efforts to promote vaccination? Now, at the same time, SARS version 1.0, our vaccines were better than these variants that we're seeing now. So the vaccines are still quite great, but, they're, but there is a little bit of a, a decline there. And so it's not that the virus, cha the, the virus changes matter too, um, but we're kind of in this, I think, unfortunate part of our conversations publicly where it's become really heated, just all or nothing kind of things. And there's a lot going on. It gets, it's confusing. And so we need to spend time together unpacking it and acknowledging what we know, what we don't know, and that it's more complicated than sort of a simple this way or that way. All right, Max, here's the question Max wants to, if you assume right. SARS-CoV-2 can attack the lymphatic system, is it plausible that you get worse immune protection than from vaccination? Yes. Yeah, so in general, if a virus antagonizes the immune system, it's possible that you would get poor immunity from natural infection than from yeah. vaccination. And in fact, for, for human papillomaviruses, the vaccine gives you much better protection than natural infection. And, and But sometimes it can go the other way. It really depends on the virus. From what I see for SARS-CoV-2, it's really a bit early to tell because we don't know, you know, we don't have enough time to do longevity studies, how long the immune response lasts. But it does antagonize uh, interferon responses. So it's plausible that vaccination would be better for yeah. sure. And that's interesting too, from a evolutionary standpoint, right? As what are the, um, and we, again, we don't know the answers yet, but if we, you know, had a time machine going forward 5,000 years or something, what will, what will be the outcome of SARS-2? Um, and in terms of, does it become endemic? How does the, you know, the, as that all plays off, plays out going forward. And so that's where, you know, evolutionary biology is interested in this too. So if we start to gain information about patterns of pandemics and how they um, interact with our immune system, we can actually work backwards in some sense to try to figure out how our immune system evolved um, under the pressure of past pandemics. And so that's you know, kind of in the infancy of really being able to make firm conclusions, but that's an area where evolution has something to say as well. Kind of a, a more focused immunology question here, but a good one. Uh, thanks, JCU, for your contribution. Uh, really appreciate it. There's also another one here from Sean. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And um, is there another one? So here's one that is actually a good segue into our picks. Will Dr. Anderson's ah. Bloomberg interview help to slow the rush to judgment on the WAV lag league? <laughs> what do you think now? <laughs> I think the answer to that question is unfortunately no, but that... Um, um, is that Danielle who had that question? So your question is... No, that, um, that was uh, LVRP, oh, sorry. LFC. Oh, okay, <laughs> LVRP, LF, um, C4, L. Yes, so um, thank you for the question. Though. It leads in perfectly to my science pick of the week, So, um, which is this uh, Blomberg interview. So Danielle Anderson is an Australian scientist who was at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which is obviously ongoing in the news headlines. And she was there until November 
2019. And so the title of the um, article, the interview, The Last and Only Foreign Scientist in the Wuhan Lab Speaks Out, and um, worth a read. So, um, you know, pouring a little bit of cold water on the idea that this was just sort of a bunch of reckless virological bandits just kind of throwing viruses left and right and, and trying to get them out there. It hints at sort of, um, you know, maybe from a more um, Western perspective, so to speak, Western scientist perspective, what goes into the, um, you know, being a virologist at a place like this, at a BSL-4 laboratory, the training that goes into this, the trusts or all of the, and, and then making observations of what it was like to work there, sort of the culture of a place like this. Um, I would also actually point back to some of the TWIV episodes. Now it feels like a lifetime ago, but some of um, <laughs> your tours of BSL-4 um, laboratories and having that kind of walking listeners through that and sort of the conversations you were having about what really goes into that kind of research. And so, you know, Danielle, I guess the take home from Danielle Anderson's interview is that she wasn't observing um, some of the more, um, you know, dark or kind of dangerous um, ideas that have been floated out there about what was happening at the laboratory. And that, in fact, um, and this again, you know, this, I think this speaks a little bit to um, in a world of limited evidence, like, you know, just pointing to sort of, well, what are the, what are the patterns that we're seeing here? And um, what for many scientists is a massive mismatch between the, um, you know, small set of viruses that were being worked on in a laboratory like uh, the WIV versus the massive reservoirs that are sampling wildlife and replicating every day. And I think this maybe adds a little bit of that perspective um, from a virologist who was there at some of the key times and noting that there weren't, you know, her colleagues weren't sort of dropping off with pneumonia symptoms left and right. No one was sick. She actually, you know, she got tested for COVID, I think several times and has never been positive, even though she was at the quote unquote ground zero, um, as has been put there. And so I think, yeah, a nice, you know, a nice balancing piece to understand a little bit from someone, an eyewitness, um, to put a little perspective here. And so that's my science pick of the week. Someone said here, uh, obviously not a top secret lab when foreigners can go there and work. Yes. Well, it, it yeah. isn't. It never was. They, they communicate. I've heard Xi Zhang Li give talks online frequently. Um, there's actually one she gave at NIH. You could go and get the PowerPoint there. It's, it's public. Um, I emailed her a few weeks ago. She responded right away. Uh, so, no, I don't think it's a secret lab at all. Yeah, I agree. Yep. How about you, Vincent? What's your science pick of the week? A little self-serving, but I think it's important <laughs> to uh, to get this out. So Amy Rosenfeld and I wrote a, uh, an opinion piece for the New York Times. It was published online on Sunday. Uh, the human well, and then it was published in the paper on Monday. Mm. The, the the title they used. So let me just say that this is not the title we picked. They didn't <laughs> want our title. Amy's title was variants, scariants. And human behavior of concern. <laughs> but they ended yeah, up cool. human behavior during the pandemic is more important than any COVID variant. Okay. So here we are, uh, yep. me and Amy. Um, the point of this is that um, no claims of virulence or increased transmission have been experimentally substantiated. Uh, yet, you know, the, the claims are, are bandering about. Someone just said, well, what about the secondary attack rate for Delta? Well, you know what? They don't consider human behavior when they calculate these secondary attack rates and the, the, the reproductive indexes. They never figure out, well, here's what happens. We're lifting restrictions. We're taking off masks. We're uh, getting together again. And there are a lot of unvaccinated people. So you have outbreaks and whatever is the most fit uh, virus is going to take off, and that's what's happening. So that's the point of our opinion: is that you should really just get vaccinated because vaccines will prevent moderate to severe disease caused by the variants. And you know, we had a whole paragraph about how the T cell epitopes are not changed, even though the antibody epitopes mm. change in the variants. The T cell epitopes don't change, and the you know we went back and forth with the editors for like two weeks. Hmm. And they said, it's got to be at the level of a fifth grader. Otherwise, we don't run it. <laughs> and that was so 
disappointing to me because I always mm. assumed that the Times readership was a little more mm. scientifically knowledgeable, if you will. So mm. they took out all the science that supported uh, some of our uh, sayings. But anyway, the the point is that um, you know, for influ and we made this point. And they left it in the for influenza variants arise all the time, which are more fit, and they they displace previous variants and sometimes a very small increase in fitness usually conferred by antibody escape a single amino acid will confer a little bit of antibody and that's enough to drive the flu uh, variant through the population without being more transmissible so the point is fitness can be a lot of things and we do say this in the article transmission is one of them but you can't conclude it's transmission or infectiousness until you do it now the experiments to do it are really hard right yeah. You yep. can't just make a pseudotype because, in my view, pseudotypes have some uses where you take the spike of SARS-CoV-2 and put it on VSV or a lentivirus, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to measure neutralizing antibodies, you could use a pseudotype. But if you want to understand the biology of a virus as it's affected by a mutation, forget about pseudotypes. Yeah. You need to use SARS-CoV-2, which means you need a BSL-3. And then you have to use the right cells, which means human lung respiratory epithelia which are not easy to come by and even then i'm not sure what that means because you know down deep in the lung is different from the upper tract and transmission yeah. doesn't occur from the lower tract it occurs from the upper tract all right so then you say let's use an animal well there aren't any really good transmission models uh for this I maybe mean, ferrets and hamsters which not everyone have and then if you use four animals and one of them has more transmission. What does that mean for people? So you see, it's really hard to uh, understand the basis of increased fitness unless it's an immune-mediated thing. So the press is way ahead. They're all conclusion. They're all concluding that they're more infectious, more transmissible, more virulent. And all I want is to back off. And as Nell says, sometimes it's not black and white. Sometimes it's gray. Let's get the data. It takes a long time to figure this out. Unfortunately. I mean, you know, I'm glad they published it, but the next day the Times runs a headline, the more infectious and virulent Delta variant is spreading through the U.S., the headline. <laughs> yeah. No, it's oh, really, well. I mean, I think this is one of the more challenging science communication issues yeah, of so. maybe of our careers. Um, and, you know, and, and maybe, you know, going back also to the evolutionary perspective, right? So there is, I mean, this is where it's more complicated is, um, you know, so transmission also f fitness feeds into transmission in some way or another, but it's really difficult and there are, and there, it can disconnect from it too. So I noticed, a, uh, a, a nice conversation happening, um, in response to your article, um, on social media, I think Carl Bergstrom, a, um, another colleague at, in Washington weighing in and saying, well, hold on, fitness transmission has something to do with fit fitness for a virus. And then someone else said, yeah, but think about, um, how do you, so can you, be less transmissible, but have higher fitness. And someone said, yeah, think about a virus that becomes latent, um, which is not what SARS-2 game is, but there are, there's all these complexities beneath the surface. And so any one statement, like, just like Vincent is saying, so that headline of it's more infectious, it's more virulent, it's more, this is the point. And then, it, and then when we try as science communicators, I think to, to bring in you know, to try to counter that immediately, it might almost shift back to the whole other side of the conversation, what goes into replicative success, reproductive success, as we mm -hmm. think about fitness. And that's not so simple either. And so it's this like, really ch challenging thing, which then put on top of that, just like, I agree 100% agree with what you're saying, Vincent, about the challenges of connecting the, uh, the biology or the virology to the um, in this case, the variant or the virus spread, it takes years. And, and with, yeah. you know, again, multiple lines of evidence that are um, to, to try to get at what is what is it that the virus that makes the virus different in a whole sea of genetic changes that aren't going to have any impact at all? What are the and, and so, um, you know, we can very quickly, I think, look at that measure that antibody escape. But just as Vincent's pointing out, that's just one part of the immune response, the T cell epitopes. And then again, we're into that complexity of immunology that makes it very hard to have that conversation or how to weigh um, what's happening. And so, yeah, in the end, I think we, you know, we're seeing these spikes, but you know, the U S has been a, a pretty good testing ground for some of these more simple ideas about transmission, which 
we haven't seen that. So the alpha variant in some regions have took over, but others haven't. There is a lot of concern that the P1 variant, as it used to be called, coming out of South America might quickly dominate in the U.S. That hasn't happened as these other viruses have competed. And then so my kind of take, I guess, is that you have these really on the whole scheme of things, minor genetic changes that just as Vincent is saying, changes the equation a little bit. So one might outcompete another, but that that the biology in the end is going to be really subtle and it gets it really does get mixed in with the human behavior. Um, in some really consequential ways. And so that kind of amplifies what's happening and makes it look like these variants have yeah. um, sort of hit the genetic jackpot when in fact, it's probably a much more subtle um, situation. And and that's where I think, yeah, how do we step back, have a little more perspective and realize that because the vaccines still work, that's why maybe returning to that as our, as our at, at least at this step in the pandemic as that's really our best way forward. And, and that also gets kind of lost, I think, in these conversations. It's, it's really yeah. complicated. Yeah, that's hard. As you said, I think yeah. it's a great point that this is a hard time for science communication. On the other hand, I'm glad we're here. You know, we yes. I started TWIV 12 years ago, and this is an optimal time to have all these pods that we've started with all my colleagues like you and others. And yes. we're, le we're learning as we go, for sure, and we'll take this going forward. It's not easy. Um, and we, we don't mean to be overly critical, but we just want people to understand the science behind our thinking, that's all. And, and you know, Dave says, can I publish it as I would have edited it? And I'm thinking mm. of that. I have to, mm. I signed some agreement with the Times, right? It was 18 pages, yep. and do you think I read it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that fine but, print might hold you up a little bit there, that's right. I'm going to go back and see if uh, I can publish it uh, on it. But if not, I will put a, an earlier version where you can see how, how it's changed a lot. Yeah, yeah. it's kind of like a preprint. You have that, uh, somehow have that, right? Yeah. So no, no. It's very and, interesting, Nels. I mean, the yeah. editor went back and forth with us for a long time, and she would make changes, and we would say mm -hmm. okay or change them back. And she was pretty good about doing that. Um, and and you know, at one point, they pulled a second editor in, and she wow. said yeah. basically, "What are you talking about? I've heard they're more transmissible." And I said, "Oh, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. We're the scientists here, <laughs> okay?" And mm -hmm. she, she backed off eventually. Mm -hmm. But um, the process is quite interesting. And then the title, the headline gets picked by their social media team. They run a bunch past their audience and see which one floats. And um, it's a yep. very interesting experience. Okay. That's it's interesting. <laughs> yeah. And, but I think perfect reason to have conversations ahead, perfect reason to do podcasting and, and to keep the conversation going, to get more voices in the conversation. We really, I think we need to do that together. It's certainly, um, yeah, this one has enough impact that scientists can't do it alone. The general public can't do it alone. The journalists can't do it alone. That's right. And so how do we somehow do a little better? And that's certainly, I think, what we're striving for, for sure. All right, let's wrap this one up. That's Tuivo number 69. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash Tuivo. Uh, you can send questions and comments to Tweevo at microbe.tv, or you could just come here to the live streams, which uh, Nels has really gotten into. So we're going to do can't these get enough of this. Yeah. Every Thank month. You everyone. <laughs> and uh, if you want to support us, there are a couple of ways you can do that. So here you can um, use the super chat. Uh, someone asked, is there another way? Because um, YouTube takes a cut. Yeah. Everybody takes yeah. a cut, right? So if you go to microbe.tv slash contribute, you could use Patreon or PayPal, but they take a cut too. And so if you want, you could send a check, and a lot of people do that. Uh, so you just email me, vincent at microbe.tv, and give me your address, and you can I'll give you my address, and you yeah. can uh, send us a check for your support. And why do we need your support? Well, um, we have expenses. In particular, we just rented a new studio in Manhattan, me and Daniel Griffin, where um, – we're going to do most of the broadcasting and do more content. And when Nels comes to New York, we could do a live Tuivo as well. That'll yeah, be I'm fun. excited about this. And congrats, Vincent, on that really great step forward. I think it's um, just a testament to the important work you, Daniel, the others in, on the other pods are really doing here. And I, I'm excited to be a visitor and to um, host co-host a Tuivo in the future in vivo at your new studio. Well, I tell you, it's the listeners because in the last year and a half, they've upped their contributions because of the pandemic, and that allowed us to move forward. So I appreciate it, and I hope we can we can continue and and keep doing more. 
Uh, Nell Zeldi, you can find him at cellvolution.org and L Early Bird on the Twitter. Thanks, uh, th thanks, Nels. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Vincent. Thanks to all you who tuned in on the live stream from around the world. And keep the questions coming, keep the conversation going. You know, it's take us a while, a little bit better at uh, hitting more of the questions. But that's what we're here for, is to, to make that conversation bigger. So thanks to all of you. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. Music on Twivo is by Trampled by Turtles. You can find them at trampledbyturtles.com. You've been listening to This Week in Evolution, the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next month. Till then, be curious. <laughs> <laughs>